Mm. Welcome to the third episode of VSML 2016 Recaps from Reality TV Warriors. My name is Michael Hamsdown and joining me as always is the Canadian who better bloody not wake me up in Antwerp with a miniature harp, Logan Saunders. <laughs> Good afternoon. <laughs> and the guy who has no problem spending so much time with strangers, David Bindley. Good morning. Good morning. I was thinking about this when I rewatched this episode uh, last week and I think we did see Saunders with it when we recorded the episode too. That would be so irritating to be woken up to the soothing sounds of of a master plucker playing his miniature harp at like six o'clock in the morning. Yeah. The best part is you think it's part of the Vidim soundtrack until they cut away from Klaus to Remy. And you realize, oh, wait, somebody's actually playing the harp. (laughs) Put it this way. If he did it around me, that harp would not have strings for very long. The harp would have strings. It would just have a head through them as well. Yeah. Maybe it would be a (laughs) rop. The harp would have mysteriously disappeared into the Caribbean by this point. Rop, how did did three harps suddenly land on you in this laser game? I don't know. (laughs) Whoop, whoop, that's the sound of damaged harp. Uh, Did you guys notice the Euroan statue at the start of the episode? No, which one, the good Euroan or bad Euroan? The good Euroan from last season. Was he sitting down? (laughs) No, he's actually standing up. If you go to two minutes, do do this right now. Go to two minutes and 34 seconds of the episode, and the statue looks like he's calling out for Rosario. It made me laugh for way too long. It does. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit less drunk and shouting about Macarena than uh, Gujaro is there. <laughs> yeah. Rosario! <laughs> that's, all. <laughs> that's all I pictured when seeing that statue. And I thought, yeah, we've we've watched a lot of Mole this year. (laughs) Yeah, we really have. (laughs) So previously, all 10 candidates got a bit salty with each other before Ellie implemented Ata Discipline for the first time. At a stair-raising memory challenge, they earned half the money on offer, but it was at an old monastery where some gained something more valuable, information. At the execution, it was a huge surprise for Logan, as his original first suspicion iron was the first one sent packing. She gone. She gone indeed. And Art says that Iron's gut said she'd last till the end or go out first, and sadly for her, it was the latter. The group struggles with the follow the money clue. People are looking for hidden clues on the notes already, but they don't realise their pockets can contain a portrait of them all. It's nice of Art to do his intro for the episode in the altar boy costume he bought from the abandoned monastery's gift shop. <laughs> that is very true. And he says the mole operates in the dark, and that's where they will be able to earn some money later on. And the episode title is The Writer Lives On. And it's day five in Santo Domingo. Marjolaine says that in Vidim, you must give up all control, and she's just living in the moment now. Her and Ellie then discuss who is going to share a room <laughs> with Cecile. Just live in the moment and lose all control. I love that Marjolaine is like YOLO, and then Rob was like, it's impossible to YOLO when this is so stressful. Yeah. <laughs> Less YOLO, more MOLO. <laughs> And as Bindle's alluded to, he says that it's a pressure cooker and it's getting a bit awkward. He's not used to spending so much time with strangers. Mm. There's a lot of construction going on in this town. A lot of construction in Santo Domingo. Yeah. Well, I found that when I was in the Caribbean last year as well, in that there's so much building work happening on most of the Caribbean islands. It's just a a fact of life for developing countries. Hmm. And the prairies in Canada. Yeah, developing countries have a lot of developers. Yeah, who to thunk? Also, how is social experiment a meaningless buzzword in the Netherlands as well? It's a meaningless buzzword everywhere. Yeah, but like, I would have thought there would have been, you know, a more Dutch expression for exactly the same thing. Well, look at Seder from Belkia. He was a he's a social worker, and they just change a couple of letters and make it Dutch. Yeah, well, Dutch isn't a real language. That is true. So they are dropped off in pairs and as a trio all around Santo Domingo for the first challenge. Inside an envelope, they will receive thirds of banknotes and must complete it using the money on five poles hidden around the city. They can only take a note if they swap it for one of their own, and to find the thousand euros, they must head underground for one of the pieces. And they've got 45 minutes. Taka and Anamika are dropped off at the Plaza de España, where the dancing challenge was last episode. Taka repeats all the instructions to us because this episode is obviously overstuffed at like 52 minutes. 
and they have a 500 euro third and a thousand euro third with 500 euros on their poll. I often have 500 euros on my poll. Yeah, I was waiting for that. I was trying. I was trying. I was trying to think of the poll joke too, in some fashion, but uh, I, I just couldn't come up with a coherent one fast enough. Yeah, you got to be more skilled with your poll, Logan. Noted. That is noted. <laughs> <laughs> just like friend of the podcast, Matt Barr. Logan doesn't know what I'm referring to there, which is even better. Is he Paul? I, was, uh, I feel like Kanye West with the fish sticks joke right now. Breaded? Is he Polish? <laughs> I suspect we won't end up discussing this on next week's Belkier episode, but uh, Matt Barr, friend of the podcast, featured on a daytime show in the UK two days ago, I think it was, because he's claiming that he has Britain's largest penis. What? He's claiming that when he's erect, it's a foot long. Is there, is, like, seriously? Or I yeah, feel like no, I'm, no, no, there's no other punchline to this? No strings it. attached? Well, I, I mean, there's no strings attached, but you might need buttress wings. <laughs> this is a genuine thing. Ant sent me the link to the This Morning clip earlier. So he is being 100% sincere, saying that's his claim. Yeah, and as I said to Bindles uh, when he saw the clip earlier, like, my questions are more about how this morning found out about him, because that's not the sort of thing that you put on a quiz show application. Maybe he did. I mean, he's uh, he he's, he uh, has. You you don't know what they were going to ask on Jeopardy. <laughs> I highly suspect, from having filled in that Jeopardy application, that he did not fill in. Fun fact about yourself: I have a foot long penis. <laughs> because knowing the TV industry as I very rarely do, that would not have got him on television necessarily, apart from on this morning. I can't imagine just Trebek like when he does the <laughs> talk about yourself interviews and then he gets gets to him. <laughs> Alex, you're being insensitive. Yeah. And Matt, it says here you've got a foot-long dick. <laughs> yeah. And now we move on to Dick, who is a professor at... <laughs> I love the I just I love the idea that somehow he was headhunted for this. Somehow someone found out that he has a foot long penis and I kind of want to know how how that came about. He truly was headhunted. I like I just assumed somebody saw him in the urinals when he was recording Jeopardy. A producer yeah. like all right, uh, let's break for five with after all these uh, interviewees and then goes into goes into the bathroom master is like, "Oh, oh We've got a story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why are you standing so far back? You know who should see this? Cat Dealey. <laughs> anyway, all I will say on that is slung live the king, slung live the king. Uh... <laughs> We're sorry, Matt. Logan isn't. We are. Oh, is that the king of the nerds guy? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's the king of the nerds guy. He disappeared from television for 10 years, reappeared on Jeopardy in probably the best episode of Jeopardy UK because all three of them came to play. It was a fantastic episode, even though we are friends with Matt and I'm biased by saying that. And then, yeah, he's reappeared on British morning television um, talking about his foot long dick this week. So, you know, standard procedure. Yeah, it's the circle of life for being on television. You go on a less than reputable reality show. You then go on a very reputable quiz show. Then you talk about your penis on television. Mm. And then what happens? Then you end up back on a reality show because of your enormous dick. Yeah. yeah. Mm, yeah. Th then you end, end up on embarrassing bodies. Yeah. Or gonorrhea at all. Or if you're really lucky, naked attraction. <laughs> <laughs> can you... <laughs> I'm not going to go into this too much, but can you imagine the reaction as the, <laughs> the screen pans up on naked attraction? Why are they stopping at his ankle? <laughs> I, I mean, I, I suppose the good news is it wouldn't be hard. Um, I mean, I've I, what, one of my friend's brothers did win if you, as much as you can win on Naked Attraction, and I have also met someone who did the casting for it a few years ago. And um, from what I've heard, they employ fluffers on that show because the studio is pretty cold. Yeah. So there is a non-zero chance it would be hard. Hmm. Sure enough, one day ago on YouTube. <laughs> 38,000 views, apparently. I love that we're recording this the same week Twitter has been going crazy about that Girthmaster idiot. Yeah. 
I also love how Logan's now Googling Matt Barr huge penis on YouTube. No, no, man. I, no, no, what, no, what, no, no, that's not what I Google. Google. That's not what I, that's not what I put into YouTube. That's not what I put into YouTube. I put Matt Barr UK and that was enough for it to come up. Hey, you, you put Matt Barr horsecock UK. <laughs> You kind of spoiled the joke there because I was going to say Logan's just interested because you know that's a similar size to a horse one. In the uh, in the freaking uh, thumbnail, they have uh, the host with a ruler. <laughs> I don't think it's a thumbnail. I think it's a full fingernail. They have the ruler and then the picture of him. Oh, jeez! This is going to make a really fun diversion for Matt to potentially listen to in a few months' time. <laughs> Again, Matt, Michael and I are sorry, Logan is not. Yes. We're not mocking your monster dong, I promise. Logan is, we're not. No, I just did not expect this to be a topic. Neither did I until this afternoon, so thank you, Anthony Williams, for bringing it to my attention. Why did Anthony Williams find, why did Ant find out? What was he googling? I presume it came up on one of uh, his suggestions, but the conversation went as follows so you know Matt, Matt King of the Nerds Bar and I said I'm aware of his oeuvre are you aware of his other quote unquote talent so I replied just being flippant I'm not sure we can legally talk about that it's banned in several countries and he replied it should be have you seen this and then sent me the link I said oh wow I mean I was joking but still surprised he could fit it behind the Jeopardy podium and there's your daily double <laughs> <laughs> it's time for triple Jeopardy <laughs> Make it a true. So anyway, back to this challenge. <laughs> Before we got derailed by talking about Matt Bell's penis. Yeah, I don't. I don't get why we were talking about his Alex Trepecker. I mean, come on. Yeah, back to we used to hold. So class and Tim are the second pair. They have two hundred and fifty euros and five hundred, and their pole is another third of two hundred and fifty. They're in the square where the first group photo was taken. Cecile, Remy, and Marjolaine are the trio, and they've got hundred euros, a thousand euros, and two hundred and fifty, and their pole is the hundred euro one. And Ellie and Roth are the final pair, and they have 100 euros and 50. And he accidentally turns the phone off, and he's Ellie's main suspect, so she wanted to test him. Remy then rings him, and he appreciates the clear communication. Mm, that's a nice change from a bit of a phone game. Exactly. Well, he's he's actually taken eight of discipline to heart, that's all. Mm. He practiced on a fork at every dinner. Yeah. yeah. He was using his forky talkie. Uh, he saw a man with onions, a man with fruit, but he didn't see a pole. And Ellie decides to take absolutely no initiative to see what he will do, which is very much not what Ellie Luce normally does. So he of giving up control, Marjolaine then struggles to give up control, and Remy is very vague, which is a perfect combination for Cecile. And Klaas and Tim decide to have a bit of fun and try and blag a carriage ride to the square where the trio are waiting for them. God, Tim just sort of wasting time trying to get the locals to speak Dutch and stop for high fives. Yeah. <laughs> that was a bit awkward. Yeah. They've already experienced enough colonization with the Spanish. Well, to be fair, the Dutch and the Spanish don't really get along. Rob and Ellie then go to the wrong square with half the time left, much to Remy's frustration. And Tarka and Anamika complete the 500 euro note, but not before Tarka answers the phone, claiming that he's Domino's. Does he have pineapple on his pizza? I hope not, because that is a literal crime against pizza, so we've heard. You know what was really, really bizarre? is while I was watching that, I was waiting for a Domino's pizza to show up at my house. I'm not even kidding. I was thinking, and I rarely get Domino's. And guess what I had uh, for dinner this evening? Pizza? It was indeed the first portion of that pizza from the pizza counter we were talking about. Oh, I had pizza last night too. Oh, interesting. <laughs> we're all very much in sync. Yeah. Chris Kirkpatrick. Yeah, his ass kicked. See, that's another m M&M clue that we missed. Do they talk about Chris Kirkpatrick in Belgia this year? No, we did though. Oh, so we're, we're so so. Uh, Papa Paratrupa is uh, is banking on us to provide hidden clues. I believe the premiere title was "It's Just N," inspired by you saying that you were going seeing a fifth of N Sync, so therefore you were just going seeing N. <laughs> just the N. Although, to be fair, I think Chris Kirkpatrick is the S. Is he? Yeah, it's, it's the last letters of their names, isn't it? Oh, I never realised that. But there's Lance. He's I the think... C. Yeah. 
<laughs> it's not an exact uh, science. The last consonant in the, each of their names. Yeah. You can't call them ensign. Yeah. It, it's Justin Timberlake and other people, not Vanna White and other people. You don't get to buy a vowel. So they then realise that they must swap a note to take a note, so they've not completed the 500 euros yet, and Rock refuses to return and help them. And the trio then complete the 250 euro note, leaving Class and Tim to try and complete the 1,000. Class doesn't want them all to be wandering around with the 1,000, stopping them earning it, so they ask some locals where they can go underground again. I like how the producers essentially probably watched a scene from The Simpsons with the quickie mark with the take a penny, leave a penny, and thought, how about we turn this into a full challenge? It's a pretty good challenge. It is. It was a good watch, yeah. Mm. I mean, obviously I don't love the maximum of 1,900 euros, but I get why they did it. The maximum is 1,750, because you can only complete three notes. Is it? Yeah, because once you complete a note, you're out of the challenge, and there's nine players. So it's 1,000 plus 500 plus 250, and then the 100 has three notes, but you don't, you won't have enough players to complete it, and then there's only 250 notes. There were four teams, though, right? There were three duos and one trio? Yeah, but you need you need three players to complete a note. Right. Like, the whole point went, like, when, I can't remember which pair it was, but they get to the third note, and then they realise, oh, we can't pick it up because we have to leave a note behind. That is very helpful, and in fact, I'm correcting my notes as we speak. I still don't particularly love 1750, to be honest, but... <laughs> yeah. Although I, I guess that does answer my question about, Logan, did you understand this challenge the first time you watched it? <laughs> I do now. <laughs> Bearing in mind, this is the second time that I've watched it, and I still didn't understand it or remember how it works. Uh, this is one of those ones where, like, when I did the challenge guide, it took me about three or four watches to sort of understand it, but then once I got it, I got it. Yeah. I like how the most difficult note to obtain was indeed in the underground. That that was more of a, mm. well, if you think you're really good at this challenge, you can try and find this, this stray thousand euro note. The irony is, like, I looked at the map to find out where it was, and I think at the end of the challenge, Class and Tim are basically about half a block away from the entrance. Yeah, I think they did actually get pretty good directions from those guys when they were yeah. battling. If they didn't waste time uh, teaching them Dutch, they would have won. Yeah. It, it's just a shame nobody thought, you know, maybe try and find out where the underground is earlier in the challenge. Yeah. And maybe share that knowledge before everyone gets eliminated with it. Yeah. So Rop and Ellie return, and that allows Anamika and Taka to complete the 500 euros, and then Rop leaves the game. Ellie grabs a 1,000 euro part and sees class quickly, but they all run out of time before they can grab the third part. And then Art gathers them together to confirm they found 750 euros of 1750 for the challenge, and Cecile keeps her parts in her hat. Remy then says that a lot of weird things happened, and it's just so tiring to have everyone be dicks to him, basically. If you were the mole, how would you play this? Bindles and I can't really answer that because we know yeah. how the mole did do this challenge. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, I guess. <laughs> you, you, we should have done you, that yesterday when we were talking about Belia. Yeah, well we, well we did at the end, but you, you're you the only one who doesn't know whether the mole sabotaged anything in this challenge. So, So if I was the mole, how would I play this? So Saunders, how would you play it if you were the mole? <laughs> I would just start screaming and yelling through the streets like a maniac. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, what 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 would I do? I guess I guess screw with the um, with the names of the squares. There were a lot of vague directions where people didn't know where they were at the start of the challenge. They would say, "Oh, there's um, let's see, oh that huge white building that can be seen from several blocks away. That might be an important landmark." <laughs> So I guess just give fairly generic directions to the other teams. Yeah, I mean, the crux of any A to Discipline challenge for the mole is to not have A to Discipline. It's to mess around on the walkie-talkies, give vague directions, all that sort of stuff. Probably call ex call excessively. Yeah, to just be as unhelpful as is physically possible, I think is the general mole tactic for a challenge like this. Uh, and I suppose sort of... It kind of helps the mole a little bit that everyone was dropped off sort of somewhere they've been earlier in the season. Like one group was dropped off at the staircase, one group was dropped off where they took the first group photo, etc. So yeah. you, that's that's what you use to remind people where you are. And then you sort of realize later on, sort of, you know, 10, 15 minutes of the challenge, 
oh shit, we don't actually know how to get there from here. Like we know where it is, we just don't know how to get there. Yeah, so I guess I guess it's more of just describing where you are with generic directions, but not be helpful in terms of how to get how to get to get from point A to point B where you don't say, well, we walked a block and this is where we are now. Yeah, because mm. on the surface of it, you'd probably say, oh, the mole can just hide some of the notes, but the mole is never left unattended in this challenge. Mm. There's never a point where people go solo in this challenge, so I don't think you can get away with hiding notes or anything like that. Yeah. Isn't Ellie solo for a little bit after Rob goes out of the game? Yeah, but I don't think she's the mole. Yeah, no way. Didn't we basically say you can just exclude <laughs> her on your suspect? No, shit, <laughs> yes, I did, yes. <laughs> So I don't think that was a sabotage. <laughs> I can rule that one out. Yeah. So at lunch, Tim has to see the pot. The money is still a mystery to them, and he doesn't trust that no one will sabotage. But they also, after the monastery, suspect that there may be a clue in the money. And they spot that the circles on the back of the notes make a photo eventually, and it looks like it should be a pattern. The best part about it is that the designs on, on the back of most of the notes... I think match a, a rop shirt perfectly, <laughs> which made me laugh. Bindles and I were discussing this earlier in the week about the whole portrait of the mole clue on the back of the money and stuff. And I hate it especially, and we'll get into this more towards the end of the season. I hate it especially because it's a logistical nightmare for them to do. They obviously wanted to keep putting these notes in to make it possible, but if they printed a set amount of notes at the start of the season, then it's physically impossible to complete this clue, and therefore it's pointless. And uh, there was one other part with it too. Oh, it's like uh, I like how they just all keep staring at it, like it's a three D image. Just, uh, just really, they're like, uh, what was it, Mister Pittman from uh, Seinfeld, the old guy who just gets obsessed with the three D three D picture? I, I, I feel like the scene could have gone on for much longer. I mean, you know, not to spoil the way the portrait looks at the end of the season, but it's it's so bad, it looks like Art just got his friends to make some pixel art. Some pixel art? Yeah. It's not even the profile picture of the the mole that was actually used in this season anyway. It's a separately taken picture. And also, it's not square. It's wonky. Mm. You'll see what we mean when you actually see the full portrait of the mole at the end of the season, because they do reveal it, obviously. But it's really, really wonky, the way they have to do it to make it line up. It's like, you remember that billboard challenge in El Salvador, where they're, like, they're basically stuck trying to make a little portrait of Queen Beatrix in the rain? It looks worse than the end result of that. Ooh. It's truly terrible. Well, at least there's one hidden clue that wasn't super obvious. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the fact that everyone solved the fact that it would be a portrait of the mole on the back of the notes after two and a bit episodes is a failure of production, I would say. Yeah. It's more swing for the fences than the monastery clue ended up being, but still. <laughs> so Anamika says that when you play Vidim, you hope for something exciting and scary like the monastery, but also paintball or a laser game. And in the evening, they head to the Fortaleza de Santo Domingo. Mm, where it's a literal war zone. For a big situation, otherwise known as the laser game. All they have to do is reach the fort behind Art, but it won't be easy. Their lives are worth a total of 1,500 euros, but who is worth what is up to them. And they must decide how much each other are worth before they run. Continuing our theme for the year as well, there are also doublers in the field. If they pick those up, they can increase the pot even further. And Class's treasurer is given the money to distribute. Something that wouldn't air in American reality TV, you or you wouldn't have a confessional of we're being chased by malaria mosquito drones. Well, this this was 2016, so drones were everywhere. Yeah, I must also point out these are not drones; these are quadcopters. There is a difference, and I have mentioned this before. <laughs> quadcopters have four blades. Okay, nerd. <laughs> Message Tim right now and say, hey. You know that confessional you made back in 2016? Well, you, sir, are wrong and a dumbass. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it, the end of your message. I know it was the best part of nine years ago since you filmed this season, but you are wrong. <laughs> Someone on the internet complaining about something? Unheard of. 
nine years later? What? <laughs> I believe the distinction, and I'm sure someone will correct me on this eventually, is that uh, drones have two blades and quad cups have four. Yeah, send that to Tim. Send that to Tim. And then he'll be like, he'll he'll read it and be like, oh, oh, I can't believe I said that. Damn it, damn it, damn it. To be fair, maybe the drones were playing a double O. <laughs> yeah. They're playing a double game of their own. So they give the most money to those they think are going to do well, namely Ellie and Tarka, and less to those who they think won't do so well, namely Cecile. Ellie is a done deal. She knows everything about dodging and shooting, apparently, which I'm sure is a great indictment for the Amsterdam police. Especially in a challenge like this that has no shooting. Yes. Famously, no shooting in this laser game. And they decide to send someone out as a scout, and Tim volunteers because he's a sacrificial lamb. Does it seem weird to you two that they made Tim, of all people, the guinea pig? Like, I, I would have thought he would have been one of the people who would have done better, like, just looking at this cast. Yeah, I think if I was going to send a sacrificial lamb out, as much as I love her, it probably would be Cecile. Yeah, I, I would have gone with like Cecile or Maya Lane, like one of those sort of people, instead of, you know, the fit young guy who probably runs fast. And also, there is no time limit on this that we see. Mm. They can take as long in the field as they want. It's very rare for a Vidim challenge to not have a time limit. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm sure there was an off-air one given that mm. it was the evening and they wanted to go to bed. Yeah. yeah, four hours. But there was no official time limit that we heard from our or saw in the screen. I wonder if they sent Tim out because they thought he has like the most, I don't know, just the type of person you would think to have game knowledge, like video game knowledge where you can, where you just have a an idea of how to describe where where the different things are located and where to go. Maybe they're thinking more of like a video, video game brain. Maybe. There must have been enough uh, time limit because um, the quadcopters would have needed to charge. Yeah. So he, try he tries to, you know, explain the sound of a drone in a confessional. And I'm like, is that a thing that only young people can do? <laughs> that is a very, very niche joke. I love it. <laughs> if you're under the age of 25, you won't be able to hear the quadcopters. So the quadcopters have lasers on them and can eliminate the candidates. And there are also shooters on the force itself. And Tarka finds it suspicious that Tim suggests taking it easy, as that is the wrong tactic in his mind. Again, Tarka, no time limit. He's such a meathead. He is. Like he's saying, it's, it's like caveman. It's always like caveman speech with uh, Tarka, where he says, why wait me run fast? If he had any more meat in that head, he'd end up on this morning. <laughs> I will point out, I believe Tark is the only hockey player we've ever seen on this show. Yes. Hockey is an incredibly violent sport, both field and ice. Tarka, I suspect, has had a fair few concussions. <laughs> the story that my dad always tells, because he played hockey at school, is that at his school they used to have a, uh, a guys versus girls hockey match every year. And if it didn't end with at least three broken legs, then they weren't playing hard enough normally. Oh, wow. Who 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 has the three broken legs? The horse. <laughs> yeah, the horse does have to be shot, I'm afraid, afterwards. Sorry, Saunders. Lucky they weren't playing polo. It's like the Mayans with the hu human sacrifice at the end of the game. It's like how water polo is a very violent sport, but that's why they don't give snorkels to the horses. <laughs> yeah, my, da my dad always says that um, when he briefly played hockey that it ended up with a lot of broken uh, broken limbs. Huh. Uh, so Tim gets shot right near the end, as they expected, and then Remy suggests jumping and strafing as he learnt that in video games. Klaus and Adamika are the next to go. She grabs a doubler and then gets shot as she's running up the stairs at the fort. And Klaus watched him, but doesn't trust him or his take-it-easy advice. He sprints, grabs a doubler, and makes it to the end zone to put 200 euros into the pot. Did you notice that Anamika nearly got shot in exactly the same spot that Tim was in when he got shot? Yeah, she wasn't paying attention to what Tim was doing at all. No. She was just taking it far too easy. Yeah. And Remy and Taka are the next pair to go. Remy says if you play a laser game in Vidim, you know you've made it. And they try and cross each other as much as they can to outsmart the drones. Taka grabs a doubler, and they both make the end point. And Taka was carrying 500 euros, so that is doubled. I don't know that we needed that many shots of Tarka's butt at the start of his attempt. 
as if you were complaining. Well, I mean, I would, but... Do I have to start a new segment called Who's Fucking Bindles now? <laughs> you know we already have that segment. Yeah, Saunders, Saunders is going to get his, asked his question later. Don't worry about that, but... So, Taco or uh, Speedy Gonzalez uh, gets across the finish line, <laughs> and... <laughs> <laughs> this show's so dumb. I love it. <laughs> so Ellie and Roth are the next pair to go. He can run, he can dodge, and he wants to show them he's got it in him. He immediately then gets crushed by an obstacle, and it's fair to say, has not got it in him. Unless the thing in him is one of the poles carrying the net. Give that man the $10,000. This isn't America's <laughs> funniest home video, Homer. <laughs> I had completely <laughs> forgotten about this, and it really made me laugh when I rewatched this episode. <laughs> I've fallen and I can't get up. What do I do? I, I mean, not to ruin however long the rest of the you know, later episodes are, but this Rob's a comedian, and this is the funniest thing he does all season. He's like uh, Bender from Futurama when Bender's on his back and he can't get back onto his feet because he just struggles there like a turtle. Rob's like a turtle for quite a while when he gets trapped underneath the box, the crate, the pillar, um, the slab of concrete. <laughs> and and the, the best thing is, he, as soon as he, like, he takes so long to do it that as soon as he gets out, he runs straight into the path of a drone. I was going to say, my favorite thing is the snipers take so much pity on him. They don't go for him while he's trapped in the net. They let him escape and then let the drone get him. Venom rarely goes into like full on blooper reel mode, but in this case they did. They because they showed Rob getting caught the first time, falling amongst the boxes, and then they replay it in slow motion. I was waiting for like the 1970s style like Scooby Doo music where they run <laughs> run back and forth in the hallway between the doors. I was waiting for that kind of just blooper reel, just replayed in slow motion, then super super fast motion. And yeah, that's that's what it seemed like. It totally takes you out of the episode. To be fair, if this episode had any more bloopers in it, we would have seen a scene in the first challenge of somebody being told where the underground entrance was and just been going, descend? What does that mean, descend? I think it means, <laughs> what's vertigo? So Ellie obviously loves the laser game. It's everything she does in the police. She reaches for a doubler and makes the end. She was like a fish in water. However, she did not grab the doubler from the pole. I feel like they were clowning on Ellie a little bit there. You think? Yeah, because she got like one of the confessionals, like uh, Amazing Race Ron being like, oh, this is just like being in Baghdad uh, about how this is exactly the sort of thing she's trying to do as a cop. And then they show her missing the one job she had to do. You mean to tell me for a second that this season of Venom takes the piss out of Ellie Loost in any way, shape or form? Oh no, she's Ellie Loost and you would never do that. So Marjolein and Cecile are the last pair. Cecile apparently once had a form where you could own up to your own fashion sins by wearing white leggings. And she's basically doing it now. She looks like a hockey mum, and Rop loves it. I can't recall a time where somebody has just laughed for so long in their confessional trying to describe a situation. Do you remember how I said that Cecile Narix is an absolute icon? This is the sort of shit I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. I mean, my entire note for this section is, and then Cecile Narix does a laser game feat Marjorie Kearney. Yeah. Like, this cast is just full of weirdos, and this is a sort of moment where it pays off. And she succeeds. She gets across. Yeah. Maya Line gets shot first, leaving just crazy cheerleader Cecile. She has a moment of madness and grabs the doubler and makes it, and she claims she was not wearing leggings, it's white skinny jeans, and she's sticking to it. They should have put the whole 1,500 euros with her. They would have had three grand. Just put it, bet the house on Cecile. I have a question. She she tells us, you know, it was a crazy move for her to grab the doubler, but wasn't she the last person? Yeah. I think she more meant that it was a crazy move because it was in the path of a drone or something. Okay. So Art returns and confirms that Class earned 200 euros, Cecile got 200, and Tarka got 1,000, as well as another 300 for a total of 1700 of 3000 for the challenge. You know, 1700 is a pretty good win for a challenge when they were initially told the total price was 1500. Yeah. I do wonder what the bare minimum 
everyone was allowed to carry was because there weren't enough doublers in the field to let everyone have one, I don't think. Certainly not that we saw. No. I think 50 euros because they had set notes they had to use. Yeah, I wonder if people were allowed to run with zero, though. Yeah. And Rop says in confessional that Anamika gave herself 200 euros for the challenge and grabbed a doubler but got caught at the last minute and her disappointment doesn't seem authentic to him. They then go out for a beer afterwards and a band plays La Bamba for them. Again, Year of La Bamba. And Cecile celebrates by putting her MP3 player on in the bus and plays Anita Meyer. Which I think was one of the mime karaoke songs in Czechia. Almost certainly. Feels like the sort of thing that would do. Yeah, anyway, this this very much does not date the episode, Cecile plugging in an MP3 player to the bus. <laughs> yeah. And for the Canadians amongst us, MP3 players are coming in about a decade. <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm I'm good with my LimeWire account right now. Yeah. You'll soon learn about iPods and Creative Zens. Yeah. Tell both your friends on Friendster. <laughs> Come on. We're up to my space now. Are we in your top eight, Saunders? No. <laughs> Rude. <laughs> no, the entire top eight is Matt Barr's penis. It's Bojack Horseman, uh, Mr. Ed, <laughs> Sea Biscuit, uh, Secretariat. New feature, can Saunders name eight different horses? <laughs> <laughs> he got up to, what is that, four? You got up to four, so yeah. It's just... Um, it's just going to be all Bojack Horseman characters. Red Rum, that's one. This is a fascinating game of Nay That Horse. Nay That Horse, yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> so it's day six, and class looks on lovingly while Remy plays a mini half in the hotel room. And apparently he does it every morning, which feels to me like it would be bloody annoying six days in. It feels like there are better ways to keep your fingers in working condition in a hotel bed in the morning. Maybe Klaus just likes it because it's like it's his own theme music. And they head up into the hills for the final assignment of the episode. Art says to us that the old moles warn them that, that the mole doesn't mind if money comes in sometimes if there's an opportunity to take it out later. Not everyone took that advice to heart. When they won in the forts, Remy challenged the mole and said they were failing. A surprise awaits them, which could cost them dearly. The, the fun thing is, I don't think the... From memory, I don't think the old moles ever actually did warn them of a pot drone. Or at least if they did, we weren't shown. I think the closest the old moles came was saying that the mole doesn't mind occasionally if money goes into the pot because they'll have a chance to take it out later. Yeah. I think Art was actually telling the truth when he said that. Because I mm. remember it from the last episode notes. They didn't specifically say there would be a pot drain coming, but, you know, it's Vidim. Of course there's going to be a pot drain coming. You can't have happiness in this show. So at the Parque Mirador de Engombe... They find him waiting. He does his test speech to their faces, and one person will receive power over the test and decide which five questions won't count for anyone. But the question is what they are willing to bid for that power. And from now on, they are given a vow of Omerta. Only the second highest unique bid will be accepted. The main question with this is, do you think this is actually an advantage? Is this the only time they do this twist in Vidal? Yep. I mean, as much as Vidim sort of does the same kind of challenges over and over, like the Path of Temptation, the Laser Game, all of that sort of stuff, they don't really repeat a challenge. I, I'm pretty sure there's a couple of other challenges where like, they can affect the test in, in different ways, but I don't think there's anything like this again, which is good because this is not good television. No, I don't think this is a very good advantage either, especially yeah. when it ends up with them bidding like two grand for it yeah the only way that knocking five questions out the test is good is if you're confident on your mole mm. so ellie goes first she chooses not to go high because everyone else will rob says it'd suck if they drain the pot but there's enough time to build it up again and it'd be a shame if he didn't have the chance to get it back up tarka follows his gut thinking the mole will go high my line says there's so many people so anything could happen and she's going for the money Class says he wants to pick five questions, but if there's no money in the pot, it's pointless. Cecile wonders what the best tactic would be. She goes for an amount with her lucky numbers in. Tim wasn't so sure of himself that he minds getting the questions or not, but whoever wins could get rid of five questions he knows, and he could be on a plane back home. Anamika thought to go low, but she wanted power after some thought. And Remy's giving nothing to the mole, 
He's certainly enough to do the test, even without those five questions, so writes down zero euros. Spoilers for about five minutes later, Remy, that was not a good decision. You shouldn't have been confident. Would he have gone regardless? I honestly can't remember. That is the sort of thing they'd mention at the reunion, but I can't remember who has the power. I think I remember, but I can't remember certain. So I'm hoping the mole wasn't the one who did this with the pot drink. I don't think they were. No, I think the whole point of the second highest person winning it is so the like the mole can bid high, but then it doesn't affect you know the amount that goes out. Yeah, because I was thinking it'd be a crappy twist if the mole was the second highest bidder. But we we never find. I'm certain we never find out which questions get taken out. So no. really, we're watching people bid on something we never get to see that doesn't seem to impact a hell of a lot. You know, it, it's no surprise they kind of shoehorn this in it like very quickly at the end of the episode. I think they were expecting this to be a lot more interesting than it is. I think, too, it's funny because yesterday we just recorded the Belgia podcast about the doublers. If if it's okay for a twist to not fully play out to its full potential on TV, and then the very next day we're talking about a twist that definitely did not play to its full potential, or maybe it did play out to its full potential. And this is because I was thinking, how could this exact twist play out in an interesting way. Yeah, I mean, there is a certain degree of irony in us doing that entire conversation yesterday when the first bit of this season especially has a lot of twists that just do not land. Yeah. Between the old moles at the monastery, the whole sneaking the portrait on the back of the money, which gets busted way too quickly. Mm. They're already talking about it in episode three, which... I don't think it was production's intention, and then ending this episode with this twist. Yeah. I don't think any of those played out the way that production hoped they would. No. Yeah, but this this specific one to impact the quiz, it's just that we the audience can't play along with it at all, and it's yeah. too convoluted to properly explain at the reunion as well, because I'm guessing they don't, because my assumption would be it would take way too much time to say which five questions were pulled from the quiz, Mm. how that impacted who was executed, and then also everyone's bids. They're not going to have time to really explain that at the reunion. Yeah, if I remember rightly, they reveal who got the advantage here, but they don't reveal the five questions. Yeah, I think they they might have revealed who would have gone home as well. Um, In fact, I'm pretty sure they do. Um, But... I think what this really needed is some sort of some sort of way for us to see all of the bids and then sort of, you know, use that to try and work out where the mole might have been in the like the overall ranking of the bids. I think they should have also revealed who had the, the winning bid too, because that would have caused tension within the group and conflict as well, as opposed to, oh, it's completely anonymous, you'll never find out. So it doesn't, there's no real payoff to, because the pot drain is supposed to create tension. It's supposed to create conflict, like we've seen with Belgia or earlier this year with uh, Vidim, where the pot drain is supposed to be, that's supposed to be the big little betrayal. And you got to figure out, was it, was the mole involved or was it just a contestant who went way overboard and now is completely outcasted by the group? Here we don't have any of that. It's just, yeah, a couple thousand euros are taken out of the pot and Remy are gone. Yeah. Do you think it may have been impacted by the backlash from the previous week? Do you think they maybe went back and changed the ending of episode three in terms of giving us the information? Well, the information's already out there. 90% of people are locked in on the mole. Yeah. It's not like they can undo that clue. They could have just outright said, uh, "This person is the mole, and this is how uh, this is all their sabotages as the season goes along." <laughs> I mean, in terms of like your idea of showing us who bid what, yeah. maybe they went back and hid all that information to at least try and hide the mole a bit more. <laughs> maybe um, I think, from memory, it took a few days for the hints in that monastery challenge to sort of like for people to put two and two together. And I think by the time, you know, those hints sort of became public knowledge, I wonder if there might not have been enough time to re-edit the episode. Yeah. Uh, Like, that's the only thing I could think of. 
because I, I know it was discovered in enough time that a lot of people on Suspect List changed that week yeah. to the correct person. So it's now time for the test. 20 questions about the identity and actions of the mole. Whoever knows least goes home except for the mole who can never go home. Ellie says that Rop is top of her list. She decides to keep spreading them. Rop says it's become clear that they'll lose someone every few days. He suspects Anamika as she creates confusion. Tarka also keeps spreading, but his mole could be Ellie. She didn't grab the doubler, but she did win money in the laser game. Mari line went for three people last time, Ellie, Rop, and Anamika. Remy did some weird things yesterday, so he's been added to the list. Tim is class's main suspect. He lost 50 euros, but he gave bad advice. Cecile says Ellie again didn't do well. If she could grab a doubler, then Ellie could grab a doubler. She missed a poll and didn't see the thousand euros as well. Her Ata discipline does not mask her sabotages. Tim says he had iron on his list, which means he was wrong, so he's rethought his choices. He's on Anamika. She's fanatical but screws things up. Anamika says Tim is hard to read and class doesn't really add anything. He brings in money, but he makes sure there isn't any money still left in the pot. And Remy says the only thing you can trust is a statistic of who it isn't. Keeping the right mole in your sights is the only way to keep yourself in the game. Spoilers, Remy did not do that. You. Art chills at the execution table before announcing that 2,345 was the second highest bid, but they don't have any 5 euro notes in this season, so he knocks it down to 2,340 euros, meaning that they have earned 110 of 4,750 euros for the episode, and 1,810 euros of 11,750 for the season so far. He doesn't announce who had the power, but he does instead show that Ellie, Tarka, and Tim all got green screens before Remy gets the red. And we get another instance of Art having to tell them they can say goodbye. Which, like, if this was Belgium, somebody would have stuck you never can say goodbye on their playlist, and they would have used that as a clue. Oh, almost certainly. <laughs> you know what should have happened is that uh, uh, when Remy gets executed, he should be all sad grabs his bag, pulls out the harp, and plays himself, plays out his own exit music all the way to the car. See, that's why they've never casted a trombone player. <laughs> I can also tell you at this point, Saunders, that Remy was my first suspicion. Oh. Well, that was dumb. I know. I'm aware of that. <laughs> he wasn't in my top three in week two, which is all that matters. <laughs> why would you have him as your number one suspect? He wasn't the mole. He, he was mega sus in week one. You understand Far how the show works, than I right? Was. <laughs> I mean, those in glass houses should not throw fucking boulders, Mr. Saunders, with Aaron <laughs> Mullane as his first suspect. <laughs> yeah, but we're, hey, don't deflect. Don't deflect. If we'd been doing pool, you would have lost your first <laughs> suspicion like you did this year in Vidim. Yeah, but Remy wasn't... You picked Remy as your number one suspect, but... He wasn't the mole, so I don't, I, what, I don't know what you were what you were trying to do. I was young and misguided. I was in my very early twenties at the time. <laughs> so he says he made an educated guess, which is the best you can do. He doesn't regret his zero bid. Bidding so much is useless, as you won't have any money left in the pot. He had an incredible time, and he says it was once in a lifetime. And it is. He never comes back. He gone. Yeah, and he has one last request right before he gets into the car. He says, "Art," and Art says, "Yes, Remy." And then Remy says, "Can you can you pluck <laughs> can you pluck my harp for me before I go?" And Art says, "Yes, Remy, I can pluck." And then he's gone. And on that note, who's plucking, Saunders? Who is plucking? Okay, let's let's take a look at these uh, mother pluckers. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Anamika and <laughs> your Anamika uh, guest last week worked so well. Not Rop, not Rop. I would say Anamika and Tim. I'll go back to Anamika and Tim. Interesting. You'll find out in a few weeks. And my number two, uh, and my backup choice, uh, Cecile and Remy. Okay. <laughs> So next time, the group heads to the beach, Cecile kayaks, Tim gets confused, the black exemption enters the game, and the chest is atop a cliff, which could bear a lot of fruit. Who do you suspect, Saunders? Alright, so my number one suspect is Rop. He's Rop of your list. He's Rop of my list, yeah. Yeah. Uh, then Clace and Anamika. 
and then it was Shremi, but he gone. Uh, Maroline, uh, Cecile, Takataka, Taka, and then Tim. Interesting. Mm. I assume it is, because you know who the mole is. And who do you think has <laughs> gone home next week? Maroline. I think Maroline's gone. She gone. She gone like yesterday. She gone. And Also interesting. Yeah. and But she's, she's not going to have a harp, luckily. But seriously, Remy, all Remy had to do was play. Remy just needed the harp to play himself out. I can't believe he didn't go through with that. About this point in the season, I kind of forget which order the people go home in. So it's sort of interesting trying to, you know, listen to Logan pick who's going to go home next when I don't remember who's going to go home next. I definitely remember who goes home next week. Okay. And do you want to eulogize Remy? Is there enough to eulogize him for? Or shall we just tell him to pluck off at this point? Yeah, pluck off, Remy. Pluck off. Mm. I mean, he seemed nice. He did seem nice. He seemed like a nice young man. Yeah. Who is definitely not plucking anybody in this cast. Yeah. Didn't you say that um, that he no longer plucks as well, Biddles? Uh, so it sounds like he's sort of branched out into other instruments. So he's like he's still doing the harp, but not exclusively harp. Like he's doing guitar and all of that sort of stuff. He was a plucky upstart, was he? Yeah, basically. I've heard he uh, started playing the triangle and electric guitar, the bongo drums, and uh, a trombone. I think that's all five instruments from Donkey Kong 64. (laughs) He bongo. (laughs) One final question, because I've got to ask you the suspect list question, Saunders. Was the mole shot in the laser game? Is your bonus question this week? Was the mole shot? Was the mole shot? The four people who were shot were Tim, Anamika, Rop, and Mayaline. Uh, no, the mole was not shot. Okay, interesting. Anything else you guys want to say about this episode? Nah, I'm good. This was really fun until like the last 10, 15 minutes. And then it just yeah. kind of... Once they get to the auction, I'm like, get on with it. Hurry this thing along. They were too much money. We got to introduce the pot drain. Yeah. You know how Vidum works. Yeah. What? 1715 one episode. We can't have this. Our budget can't sustain this show. Here, guys, quickly bid 2,000 euros. <laughs> I think from memory, this is the only pot drain, though. Yeah. I don't remember another one anyway. Oh, well, I barely remember this one. So, thank you for listening to our Vista Mall 2016 recap. We'll be back next week to continue the hunt for an old mole in the Dominican Republic. Don't forget you can contact us on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, or Instagram, where we are RTV Warriors, or you can email us and contact at rtvwarriors.com. Logan is on the artist formerly known as Twitter at Logs of Kowaki. Vindas is a grim recapper, and I'm MJ Helmstone. You can also support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash rtvwarriors. Thank you as always to Marika for the subtitles, and we will see you next week. Peace out and just chill till the next flavoring, mother pluckers. <laughs> I don't know how we made Matt's bar a running joke, but he schlong.